This is a Peralta News special report. Recently, evidence has surfaced that Richard Aoki may have been an FBI informant. In 2008, we interviewed Richard Aoki at length, and here is his story in his words. The struggle for freedom, justice, and equality transcends racial and ethnic barriers. Was he an FBI informant? Or a committed revolutionary? Here's Richard Aoki's story in his own words. This is a Peralta News special report. I'm Jeff Heyman. In 2008, Peralta TV produced an award-winning documentary on the origins of the Black Panther Party at Merritt College. As part of the documentary, we interviewed Richard Aoki, who was active with the Panthers at their formation. He later became an administrator, counselor, and teacher at the Peralta Community College District. Now, in light of the allegations that he may have worked with the FBI, we have decided to air Peralta TV's entire interview with Richard Aoki. Was Richard Aoki an FBI informer, as recent allegations suggest, or was he a committed revolutionary? And now, part three of our exclusive interview with Richard Aoki. Here he describes his role in the Panthers' action at the California State Capitol. When the idea for that came up, um, I was in on the planning of that. And if you notice that um, Huey and I weren't up there. And the reason for that is, and the British military system, uh, they usually have the commanding officer and an executive officer. If they go into battle, um, they, they go in a column, one officer is at the front and one's at the back. If they go in a line, one is at one end and one's at the other end. That is so that if it really gets heavy, they won't lose both officers at the same time. So it was kind of like a drawing of the lot, who's going up there. Uh, we had two co-founders. We had um, Bobby and Huey. So Bobby says, I'll go up there. And Huey says, I'll do the backup. And there were other uh, branch captains, you know. And there was Mark Comfort out of East Oakland. I felt comfortable. And Mark wants to go up there. <laughs> he's big. He's got his stuff. And I'm branch captain, too. But I'll stay with Huey. So when they got busted up there, it was good that Hugh and I were down here. We were able to get them out. We didn't lose everybody. Um, one of the things was if it got as far as the shootout, we wouldn't have lost all our officers. Uh, I personally feel that it was, a, it was a positive political act, that regardless of whether the Mulford Act was passed, it did... Uh, bring, it did get attention, not only nationally, but internationally, that there were uh, freedom fighters in this country that were willing to go to the mat on something like that. Because up to that point, if you recall, um, armed self-defense resistance was not the norm as far as the liberation struggle was concerned. So when that event hit, and I'm aware of negative publicity and the uh, outcome of it, uh, it was still uh, something that had to be done historically. Don't forget, I uh, uh, majored in social welfare when I was at Berkeley for my graduate work. Uh, I did that for several reasons. Ron Dellums had been through that school about four years prior, and Melvin Newton had been through that school about two years prior to my getting my bachelor's degree in sociology. And um, I wondered what I was going to do when I grew up. So <laughs> I uh, looked at graduate school there, and the party was getting ready to really fully implement the survival program, starting with the Breakfast Children program. 
and it would thought be a good idea if I go into social work and take over the um, survival programs once I got my degree because uh, they had a new major up there, community organization and public administration, and I qualified and I got in. And I was in the middle of that when things sort of got out of hand at Berkeley and the Third World Liberation Strike came along and I was um, appointed Minister of Defense for the group there because of my background and we were able to effectively establish an ethnic studies uh, department up there as a result of it. Now as a funny footnote, I was elected president of the social welfare students while I was sitting in the Berkeley City Jail because my fellow students thought it would enhance my chances of acquittal at a trial if I was going up there representing all the students at, in the School of Social Work, you know. And anybody that knew me as a youngster would have been or was astounded that I was in Social Work Graduate School at Berkeley because that would have been their last um, guess about where do you think Richard's going to school and going to be when he grows up? <laughs> social work you must be kidding why um, and as you may know historically the survival programs did enhance the political effectiveness of the Black Panther Party uh, I'm trying to think of Ruth Jones who joined the party when she was 68 or so because of the survival programs and the assistance we were bringing to the community in other words, up to about that point, many people in the community weren't totally convinced that we were uh, um, that we were nothing more than thugs and gangsters. And I have to again reiterate that uh, the first wave of recruits to the Black Panther Party came off the streets. They came out of the bars and the pool halls and uh, places like that. It's the wretched of the earth. Uh, and it wasn't until the survival programs got off the ground, feeding the children, helping senior citizens, providing medical services, uh, visits to the prisons for the incarcerated uh, inmates that the community then uh, began to take the Black Panther Party more seriously and as a legitimate um, institution and organization because uh, I remember the image of the party initially was that of gun-toting <laughs> uh, militants who uh, were nothing better than um, gangsters, uh, but the survival programs convinced the community that uh, we were on the level and that was due to the political correctness of our position. Uh, Serve the people is a direct quotation from Chairman Mao. The Communist Revolution in China uh, the underpinnings of that was to serve the people and that came out of also the little red book and studies of what happened in China and successful um, revolutions that were taking place in the rest of the world, Asia, Africa and Latin America, that these were struggles for the people. Now in the United States they have this cockamamie thing of for and by with the people. This was the real deal of the times. Now as you may be aware the Breakfast for Children program has been co-opted by the federal government. They now give free lunches out to all the little children out there that qualify for it. But it really was a result of the Black Panther Party's uh, pioneer effort to address a serious uh, social problem. Uh, there was a community school in East Oakland that was established to 
uh, uh, address the limitations or the um, lack of real education in the Oakland school system. Having been a product of it myself, I can attest that there was a need for the community uh, school founded by the party out there in East Oakland. We need, we need them here today considering the state of the Oakland school uh, district as it is now. It's in state receivership. Give me a break. What we attempted to do was to take those uh, regular uh, organizations and provide alternative or parallel institutions um, for them. Like when I became a social welfare student up there, it wasn't with the idea of becoming a career social worker to go to work in the bureaucracies of the social work world, because that's what 90% of the students, <laughs> my fellow students, were doing. Um, that was their thing. Now, the interesting thing is that <laughs> If you look at the class background of my fellow students, I was an oddball. I came off the streets of West Oakland, and here I was in a school with graduates of Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, Radcliffe, Bennington, um, the really daughters of, of the wealthy. That's what threw me off up there while I was in the school from a social a standpoint. And then we go into the politics of it, of where we're coming from. That's a whole uh, different story. I value formal education very highly for a number of reasons. Number one, my culture, Asian, um, does value formal education, but uh, not for the same reasons that a lot of people uh, value education to get the material stuff, but it's more for an expanding of the mind, holding uh, of being able to critically analyze what the heck's going on. And as I said earlier, I push education harder than those drug dealers push their dope there on the streets of East 14th and the pimps pushing their holes down there on San Pablo Avenue. But there's also informal education. That's the education you get from life itself and the lessons that can teach one. Um, I'm fortunate in that I've had good education throughout um, my life. That I'm, I did go to a ghetto junior high school, but I went to a fine high school. I went to a fine community college and I ended up going to a fine university. <laughs> um, so I do encourage young people to bear down on their formal education, get their bourgeois credentials, but at the same time, uh, don't forget where you came from. And one of the reasons why I got involved in the ethnic studies business, which launched my <laughs> teaching career, was because I wanted to reduce the domestic brain drain. When I was at Berkeley, I ran into a lot of foreign students, students from Asia, Africa, and Latin America who were coming to this country to get an education and not going back home to their own country. In the 60s, there were more Iranian doctors in New York City than there were in all of Iran, and that's kind of sad. And When I met a student from uh, parts of Asia and Africa, uh, many of them couldn't go back home because of the political situation in the country. I do know of a few that did return home to conduct the struggle um, once they got their degrees here, but they were rare. A lot of them decided to take advantage of being in America with its great you know, material wealth. But there's more to life than material wealth. Getting back to domestic brain drain, we could see where the talented tenth of the third world communities in the United States were going to the universities and getting their degrees and getting their jobs, getting married, and then moving out to the suburbs. 
Meanwhile, the conditions in the ghettos and the barrios and the Chinatowns were awesome. They needed doctors, they needed skilled professionals to help the people in the community. And the analogy of the third world and the United States and the oppressed communities here within the United States and what effect it was having. We think that uh, this educational process is necessary and it's the people that will cause the revolution and it's the people that will cause the change in the country. Uh, the Black Panther Party is simply the vanguard of the revolution and we uh, plan to teach the people uh, the strategy and the necessary tools to uh, liberate themselves. There's this uh, United Negro College Fund saying about mines is a terrible thing to waste. There's potential in the ghettos and barrios and the Chinatown. They just need the opportunity to uh, be able to utilize the brain power there. I did study Du Bois and his uh, notion of the talent tenth, but he's somewhat limited in one respect. He it sort of just focuses on the the bourgeoisie part of the community. And I'm more interested in the bottom part of the community. And that's why I decided to uh, spend my life uh, in the community college arena rather than staying at Berkeley. And I, I could have stayed at Berkeley, gone going on to get my doctorate uh, and become a professor up there. But um, Dr. Norval Smith gave me the opportunity to come home and share uh, what I had picked up there at the university as a result of my formal education. And I hope I've done well. Dr. Smith passed away about three or four years ago, an outstanding educator especially when he hired me. I mean, he was taking a chance. There was opposition uh, at the college at the time of my appointment. <laughs> uh, I remember the, the hassles I had. The first class I taught, I had three undercover police in it, one from Oakland, one from Berkeley, one from Richmond. At the same time, I had uh, members of the Wa Ching Chinese youth gang in the class. And, at one point uh, during the term, the three uh, representatives of the state and the three or four Wa Chings were on either side of the room. The rest of the students were in the middle wondering what the shit's going to happen now. And I told um, everybody there that don't start nothing in my class. I'm going to get blamed for it because as the instructor, I'm supposed to be in charge. If you're going to shoot it out with one another, do it across the street off of college property. Plus college property, we can't have violence according to the policies and regulations, and I don't want to get hurt. And I think I was packing too at the time. I was saying, I don't need this. Yes, the dean came over and later apologized because he realized he had a number of undercover people in classes, and especially mine, because coming from Berkeley, I had that reputation of being not only a Black Panther, but a Maoist as well. So uh, that was a little uncomfortable. However, I managed to adjust and become a full-time employee. It took me three years to get my credentials, but I do have lifetime teaching in six subject matter areas a counseling credential and an administrator's credential, and I've done all three during the 25 to 30 years I've been with the Peralta District, and I hope I've helped hundreds of students navigate their way through the system because I wasn't able to bring the revolution about as far as the actual thing, but a revolution of the mind can often occur when somebody's ready for it and they're thirsting for the knowledge. And the formal education is one of the ways to start 
giving one the discipline and the tools, the analytical tools to ferret out what is important and what isn't important and move from there. And I will say without um, with full commitment that it was the greatest revolutionary party in the history of the United States. You can't name a group or an organization that has done more and has been more effective. Number one, I'll stack it up against Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement, uh, Booker T. Washington's you know, Get a Trade uh, movement, um, even Du Bois's Talented Tenth thrust in the NAACP. Uh, you really can't name any other African-American group that has done so much. Now, even today, you find uh, references to the Black Panther Party in some of the most uh, surprising places. I first saw Forrest Gump some years ago when it first came out and was tickled pink at how they were able to integrate the Black Panther Party into that movie. Getting back to the Breakfast for Children program, hadn't, if it had not been for that, you wouldn't have the government free lunch uh, programs today. Um, I could go on and on uh, into other sectors of society uh, demonstrating the impact of the Black Panther Party. I think the most important lesson to come out of the Black Panther Party movement was um, really the power uh, of the people. It was people generated. There was no big time money, nobody paying $150,000 for a candidate's clothes, you know what I'm saying. It was people power. It was people like you and I getting out there uh, saying, we've had enough of this shit and there's got to be a change. And I'm not talking about any cosmetic change like putting lipstick on a pig. I'm talking about fundamental change of material and of mindset. You don't see people going back, or I, there are some people, you don't see people going back to the old days of the banjo strumming, watermelon eating, tap dancing, plantation stuff. Nobody wants to hear that stuff no more. We now have to think in terms of the future and the type of society we want a type of society where production is for need and not for greed, and the greed of Wall Street that we are experiencing now, where we have um, people's rights before property rights. That should be the significance of building uh, a new society. And that's kind of a vision that was implicit in what we were looking at. We were looking at a better world free of racism, discrimination, oppression, exploitation. I mean, if that isn't something to marvel at. Um, and when you think about it, the party only had about 5,000 members at its height, uh, and yet lost the best of, of, of the best of, of, of the group, and I'm, uh, I have to include people like Bunchy, Carter, John Huggins, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, little Bobby Hutton, um, and there are still uh, others in prison, Rochelle McGee. Um, the good news is Geronimo Pratt's been out now for a couple of years, and it was obvious he would frame Otherwise, why would the state of California give him $3.2 million for the 28 years he spent in prison? If that doesn't demonstrate Kate, uh, state culpability, I don't know what, what does. So uh, the Black Panther Party has made its mark on American history and has made a positive mark on American history. Future generations will probably look back and say, that was a great group. And I'm talking about maybe 
over the next hundred years, it's still too early to uh, make uh, positive statements in reference to history. Well, if, but if we look at U.S. history, the abolitionists during their time, they were considered crazy, but uh, people like John Brown, um, uh, Frederick Douglass are now revered as, as heroes and um, they were not nonviolent men. Uh, John Brown died for the cause. It's interesting to note that W.E. Du Bois wrote 43 books and only one book did he write about an individual and that individual was not black, it, he was white. That was John Brown and why? Because John Brown gave his life for the cause, not only his life, but several of his children died in attempting to liberate the slaves. I am most proud of the fact that when the call was given, I stepped forward. And I kind of uh, chalk it up to the saying that a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And I realized that has sexist implications but I grew up in the period where that was a very popular <laughs> saying that a man's got to do what a man's got to do. I have to be candid. I was engaged to be married at the time of the beginning of all this and I had a very difficult choice to make within the first month of the party. It was either the party or my fiance. History noted that I I stepped forward and gave up that part. I will say my personal life is something that was severely damaged, but professionally, I was much better off for politically going with the party at the time when the party needed me. And in a way, I needed the party to get my head together politically. And that's what it did. And I'm proud of the fact that um, I stepped forward when the call was given. Can't ask for much more than that. Um, what can I say at this point? I have no regrets, to tell you the truth. It's just the way history moves. Fanon uh, points out that each generation is faced with an awesome task. And how that generation meets the task is the way that generation will be judged. And I'm not only proud for myself, I'm proud for Bobby and Huey and all the others that stepped forward to uh, demand freedom, justice, and equality for all, not just for black people, for all people, because the liberation of people of color will be the liberation of all. That is our interview with Richard Aoki, a longtime Peralta College's faculty member, administrator, and counselor. Richard Aoki was active in the formation of the Black Panther Party. This interview was conducted in 2008 as part of Peralta TV's documentary, Merritt College, Home of the Black Panthers. Richard Aoki died in 2009. FBI documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act have been made public by the Center for Investigative Reporting and author Seth Rosenfeld. They indicate that Richard Aoki was an FBI informant from 1961 to 1977. No one at the Peralta Community College District knew about his secret life. And we don't know what he reported to the FBI. That material is still secret. We do know that Richard Aoki influenced hundreds of activists and was a role model for thousands of students. He emphasized the importance of education. This has been a Peralta News Special Report. I'm Jeff Heyman.